Cameron here, and today I want to talk about my two favorite things, the law and college football, and how they intersect with each other on two specific issues. So, first, uh, back when the Power Five conferences were ultimately deciding whether or not they were going to move forward with college football this fall, to ultimately opted not to, the Big Ten, the Pac-12, a group of college football players took to Twitter, essentially uh, demanding the formation of a players association. Now, this players association wasn't simply intended, at least the guys, players, simply to protect players' general interests, but actually their specific interests under the COVID-19 pandemic. That is, certain health and safety protocols to protect athletes and also to ensure that athletes who opt out of the season are not punished for their decision. In recent days, three schools, University of North Carolina, Michigan State University, and University of Notre Dame, all elected to send students home because it was too dangerous, that is the threat of an outbreak was so great, um, and continued infection was so great, but have opted to keep college football players on campus. Engendering questions as to the college football players' status as student athletes, as opposed to employees. So I'd like to hit on, on these topics briefly um, by going over the background of the law. Now, as the law stands right now today, college football players couldn't form a union at any school. Under labor law, a union consists of employees. So you have to establish yourself as a group of employees first before you could potentially become a union. And while there has been much debate as to whether college football players are in fact athletes, as of yet, no state, and certainly the NLRB, has not actually recognized them as employees as of yet. Now, the National Labor Relations Act, which uh, federal law passed way back, determines whether or not individuals who perform services at private universities qualify as employees, and whether those uh, uh, employees can unionize and also how. Now, the NLRA is enforced by, you guessed it, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board. And we're going to get to their 2015 decision in a bit here. They are the ones who determine whether or not you are, in fact, an employee as a college football player for private universities. By contrast, each individual state determines whether an individual who performs services for a public university is an employee and whether and under what conditions those individuals can unionize. State laws vary wildly uh, in terms of whether and under what conditions employees can unionize. Now, whether certain individuals are considered to be public employees, I think is fairly standard uh, across the board among many different states. But in terms of whether you can unionize and under what conditions, it it's all across the board. So, for example, you might be at one state, which would allow for uh, the type of employee which college football players are to engage in collective bargaining. But you might flip over to another state and you have no right to collective bargaining. So you couldn't join a union. And so literally every single college football player on that team would have to individually negotiate employment contracts, which, yeah, sounds like a hassle considering that you're talking about about 80 people with varying different talent levels, skill levels, levels of experience, uh, seniority, so on and so forth, all of them trying to individually negotiate these employment contracts and, you know, the university presumably trying to do so fairly across that spectrum. It's an enormous hassle. So that, I think, is part of the reason why no state, at least as of yet, has recognized college football players uh, as employees in those particular states. I, I, I can definitely see the rationale in that regard. It, it sounds like a real big pain. Now, let's float back to 2015. Now, you had a bunch of Northwestern football players. They wanted to form a union. Um, the NLRB, in its decision, declined to exercise jurisdiction. That is, they declined to make a decision as to whether these Northwestern 
football players were in fact employees. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, you know, the song from uh, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Ooh, I love the dance, a little sidestep. That whole bit right there, that's pretty much what the NLRB did. Because the NLRB has been willing on numerous occasions to rule on whether graduate assistants, teaching assistants, um, and the like are at private universities or employees, but was unwilling to touch whether football players at private universities are employees. Now, the NLRB's decline to exercise its jurisdiction had the effect of vacating a decision by a regional director of the NLRB in Chicago who had voted in favor of the players. Essentially, yeah, that lower court, if you will, not really, but it's a regional director, said you could unionize, but we vacated that one, so you can't. So why did the NLRB ultimately decline to exercise jurisdiction? The main reason was the NLRB reasoned it would not promote stability in labor relations in this particular market. One of the biggest concerns that the NLRB had was if we ultimately rule one way for private universities and then we get a separate set of rules for the public universities, that's going to create this massive patchwork system. Imagine for a moment you're a kid in Chicago, you're thinking about potentially going to Northwestern or Illinois. Illinois rec um, doesn't recognize the football players as being public employees, but Northwestern, which is a private university, can and therefore can have certain extra benefits that they could therefore throw your way, entirely legally, because now you're kind of recognized as an employee, which would have a very um, significant impact in terms of recruiting. And the NLRB recognized this one and felt that they didn't want to get in the middle of it. Another additional reason is that the NLRB was concerned about potential um, changes in the law across a variety of different spectrums, which could potentially um, render their decision moot. Well, for example, at the time, uh, the NCAA was contemplating allowing universities to allow a full four-year guaranteed scholarship as opposed to the more conditional one. Um, and then also the NLRB was probably looking down the line at college football players being able to make money off their likeness, um, which would dramatically affect the financial life for a lot of college football players. And that could ultimately resolve this dispute as to whether um, football players are uh, employees. Crucially, because the NLRB did not rule on the merits of the legal arguments before them, it has no precedential effect. Essentially, it doesn't preclude the NLRB to reconsider that same decision in the future. And critically, as part of their opinion, they, they note, if the circumstances of Northwestern's players or FBS football, by that they meant at private universities, change such that uh, the underpinnings of our conclusions warrant reassessment, they may revisit. So essentially, as it stands right now, with the current facts as we have in front of us right now, we don't want to exercise jurisdiction. But if something big was to change in that, uh, you know, the, the whole situation college football players are under, we'd be willing to revise that. And I think the situation at Notre Dame is a great example of that because you have essentially a special class of student athlete apart from the normal student athlete, and that is college football player. Now, I think as everybody knows, what are you supposed to do when you're around people under the current COVID-19 pandemic? You're supposed to wear your mask and you're supposed to keep socially distanced. And I'm sure that's a policy that they, every single university around the country has implemented in terms of all of their staff, uh, any you know, support staff, individuals, professors, things like that. Hey, wear a mask and keep socially distant. Well, in the instance of college football players, yeah, they're gonna wear masks, but also they cannot remain socially distant the moment they engage in hitting. And if you think that there isn't a significant risk of spittle um, going around when people get hit, I'm pretty sure you may not have played college football. It's a definite risk. So you've essentially put college football players into an extra higher category of risk while at the same time maintaining they're not employees. They're going to engage in risks that other employees are not, 
but they're not employees. And they're not students either, but they gotta stay on campus. You can see how the argument really gets strained here. And this is, I think, the exact change in circumstance that the NLRB not necessarily was anticipating, but generalizing theoretically could come along and cause them to want to reevaluate at that point. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, any players at Notre Dame or any other private university ultimately engages in the same practice, gets a challenge by the players, runs it up the flagpole to the NLRB, and sees whether or not the NLRB would exercise the jurisdiction. Now, ultimately, whether the NLRB is going to rule college football players to be employees, that's a separate issue. But if this type of circumstance isn't one that would cause the NLRB to rethink their decline to exercise jurisdiction, I don't know what will be. If this isn't it, I don't know what else I, I could possibly amount under. Now, while I've been discussing all of this, I've been doing so on an individual university basis. That is, all the players from a certain individual uh, individual university unionizing. Well, what about football players essentially being able to unionize from multiple schools, um, you know, let's say across all of that, Power Five, or let's say all across Division One? Okay, laying aside that some of these people and uh, some of these players play for public versus private schools. And I just told you, it's two different sets of analyzation going on there. You can get different rulings either way. They also technically play for teams that are part of individual universities. And those universities are considered not part of a professional sports league. Instead, they are considered members of the NCAA, which under the federal tax code is a 501c3 because it fosters national and international amateur sports competition. And the United States Supreme Court and prior precedent has uh, recognized the NCAA as an association of non-professional sports. However, these recent decisions by these three universities and potentially more to come, I think causes there to be a bit of a chink in the armor there. Um, that is to say that, hey, it was based on the idea that really it's amateur sports competition, that it's non-professional sports competition. And yet at the same time, clearly you are treating this like a professional sports organization. Now, I'm not saying um, that's necessarily they're going to win, but it is definitely an opportunity. And anytime you're trying to overcome both federal law and prior U.S. Supreme Court precedent, that's an uphill battle. And the additional problem to go along with that is that the NCAA has done a relatively poor job at providing uniform guidance and uniform instruction across uh, its member institutions and conferences as to what to do under COVID-19. This actually works to the NCAA's benefit in any sort of argument that uh, it's fostering some sort of professional sports league, because if it really was a professional sports league, it's actually not handling any sort of top-down manner like the other professional sports league. Um, it essentially would be the sports league that, professional sports league that is completely like on any others. And in fact, two of the Power Five conferences have ultimately opted out of playing college football. Another three have elected to continue. Um, and then each end of member university has been approaching um, how they're gonna be handling the COVID-19 practices uh, their own way. So, trying to demonstrate that really it is a professional sports league in the same sense the NBA is or the NFL is from a legal standpoint would be difficult. But I think these new circumstances at least allow for a challenge in that regard. Now, while the players may not be able to form a union, or at least to form a union as it stands now, they could form a trade association. Now, a trade association essentially is a collection of individuals or businesses with a common interest who pull their uh, funds and voices and things like that to maximize those interests. So the um, NFL Coaches Association is a great example. It's a trade association. It helps facilitate uh, the negotiation of these group contracts, but does not collectively bargain on behalf of its members. Essentially, the coach and the owner they're going to negotiate between themselves how much the coach gets paid per year for how many years, how much of that is guaranteed, 
what certain bonuses go into the contract, things like that. But the NFL Coaches Association is very helpful and beneficial in terms of filling in sort of standard boilerplate provisions that uh, might exist within most coaches' contracts. Essentially, it helps facilitate all that stuff. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every darn time. Now, a trade association of college football players could help, hopefully, they could, uh, help the players who are asking for a players association achieve their goals. Essentially, the trade association could act as a larger voice acting on behalf of its members uh, to represent these health and safety protocols that they ultimately want implemented, as well as ensuring that players who opt out um, aren't punished for their decisions. In addition, simply going with the trade association route wouldn't cause complete catatonic panic uh, for the NCAA and the member institutions. Now, are they going to have some concerns? Absolutely. Because it stands right now, the NCAA will not recognize a trade association by the players. But a trade association could work as a helpful compromise. So, it's not a new concept, by the way. It's been discussed and batted around ever since the Ed O'Bannon litigation against the NCAA. But it could be useful as a vehicle, not only in the context of licensing group rights of players to EA Sports, read NCAA football, that was the idea back from the Ed O'Bannon litigation, um, but also facilitating the specific current concerns the players have under COVID-19, and then also potentially um, help the negotiation of terms for uh, players being able to make money off their likeness. Essentially, the NCAA has agreed in principle to the general idea of players being able to make money off their likeness. But in terms of the specifics that they're ultimately willing to agree to, they've been kind of mum. Well, it could be helpful, not only from a uh, negotiation standpoint, but also from a uniformity standpoint, for there to, to be a trade association acting on behalf of the players to facilitate that, to be able to make those terms fairly to be uniform. Um, but specifically what they were asking for in this instance was, you know, a players association to help out uh, negotiate the health and safety measures for COVID-19. And if the NCAA were to recognize that, I think it could potentially help resolve a lot of the tensions that exist between college football players and the member institutions in the NCAA because now you would have a singular voice being able to work out all of these various different terms. Um, the old issue is whether the NCAA will ultimately agree to it. And I think if they were wise and seeing what's potentially coming down the line, as well as what we're currently dealing with in, in form of a pandemic, uh, I think it probably in the long run would be the uh, intelligent decision um, Perhaps not necessarily recognizing a union, but at least recognizing a trade association of the players um, to help work out a lot of these issues, a lot of these tensions that are going on um, at this time. Now, as always, I hope you found this informative and enjoyable.